something that people want to, you know, affirm. Yeah. Affirm right your right request. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, church family. It is good to be back with you. Uh, uh, obviously, Pastor Danny and I are back this week, unless this is all a simulation and just a manifestation of my imagination. I'm pretty sure I'm back this week. Uh, I want to thank especially uh, Joel and Isaiah and um, Aaron and Ken for leading in worship last week. Uh, for those that, uh, that were here, uh, it's always good to know that there are uh, faithful and capable men uh, who can uh, step in to lead the church in worship, uh, even uh, when Pastor Danny and I are away. Uh, those of you who uh, are in the know will know that Danny and I were uh, with our wives. We're in Anaheim last week for the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, and uh, overall the meeting went well, and uh, I hope to, to kind of uh, catch everybody up on some of the highlights uh, as the week goes on. Last year I recorded some like end-of-day videos and posted those to Facebook. This year business was so long and I was so exhausted at the end of the day, nothing I would have said at nine o'clock at night would have been helpful to anyone. So I'll try to write up a, a, just kind of a little sort of explainer and debrief for those of you that, uh, that care to know about those things. At the, uh, I've told several this morning at the SBC, there's always a couple of crazy uncles that show up to the family reunion. Um, and uh, um, even the crazy uncles were not as crazy as they could have been. So we thank God for that. Uh, but it's good, to be, uh, it's good to be back in worship with you this morning. If you're our guest today, uh, maybe visiting for the first or maybe just the second time, we haven't gotten a chance to know you very well, I just want to give a, a special word of welcome to you. Uh, if you haven't met me yet, my name's Stephen, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Baptist West Albuquerque, and we really are just privileged to have you in worship with us this morning. So if you're a guest, you can help us to get to know you by taking one of those white index cards that's in the seat back pocket of the chair in front of you or one nearby, and fill that out. It says, thanks for visiting visiting us. Uh, fill that out with whatever information you're comfortable leaving with us. And if you'll just drop it in the, uh, one of the offering plates that are, that's at our West Side Worship Center exit doors, we'll use that to be in touch with you this week. Uh, as always, members, help us to get to know guests too by introducing yourself to them. Maybe help them find their way to a small group Bible study right after worship this morning. Uh, there should be some small group, uh, group directories on the little round welcome table uh, just outside these doors, and you can find your way to one of those. We have uh, uh, Sunday school for children, adult small groups down this hallway. Our students, 7th through 12th grade, meet all the way at the end of the hall uh, in our youth room there. And so we look forward to studying God's Word with you uh, even beyond our corporate worship this morning. Uh, just by way of reminder, there are no Wednesday evening activities this week. The month of June is crazy. It's full of camps and conventions and other things, so we kind of take a break on Wednesday nights in June. So enjoy that time with your, your family. Rest up from camp from last week if you need to, or students, if you're getting ready to go to camp next week, uh, take Wednesday night and get ready so that your parents aren't freaking out Sunday night to, uh, next week to figure out how to get you packed up to go to camp, all right? So plan ahead for that. Um, by way of reminder, next Sunday evening, uh, the last Sunday of the month, we would normally meet for uh, worship and the Lord's Supper. Next Sunday evening, you received, if you're a member of the church, a letter about this in the mail and an email as well. That We're going to have the first of two uh, discussion times regarding our generations to come uh, designated fund and the purpose for that. Uh, if you have questions about that, I'll just refer you back to the email, uh, the email and the letter that you should have gotten in the mail. Uh, we'll have two discussions, one uh, next Sunday uh, afternoon at 4 p.m., and then the other will be July 17th. Yeah, I've slept since then. July 17th, it's also a Sunday at 4 in the afternoon. These are identical discussion times. We're just having two in case you can't make one or the other. Um, so they don't build upon one another. You can come to the one next Sunday or the one in July, but we hope that you will as we talk about this uh, important matter related uh, to our church. Having said all that, let's uh, stand together as we have our call to worship today from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Familiar verses to many of us, I'm sure. The Apostle Paul there in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes to the church in Rome, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We gather here as the people of Christ, His bride, His body, those who have been bought by His blood shed at the cross to 
Deliver us from every worldly philosophy and idol and ideology that falls short of the redeeming grace of the gospel. We come together in the name of Christ to declare that Jesus is Lord. Let's worship him together.
Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean sing that verse again I stand pray. Our good and glorious Father, you are holy and we rejoice in your holiness. By your hand you deliver from sin and death everyone who calls on your son Jesus as Lord. You have been gracious beyond compare and we thank you. We confess, Father, that regularly we are beset with temptation to sin And often we fall into it, following the desires of our flesh and the promised pleasures of this world. We declare our continued need for your grace. And with faith in Jesus, we return to you to ask your forgiveness and for your help that we might live holy lives. Guard our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us for your glory. In your wisdom, Lord Jesus, you have made a family of faith among all who have trusted you for salvation. We thank you for the church, your body and bride, our brothers and sisters to help us follow you more closely. Remind us, Lord, that we're not a club for the healthy and the whole, but a hospital for repenting sinners. Teach us the joy of turning from sin and the great honor of helping one another toward personal holiness. Sanctify us, Lord, as we worship you through word and action in both spirit and in truth. And bless also our brothers and sisters at First Baptist Church of Moriarty and Mosaic Church in Albuquerque. Lead them to greater Christ-likeness as they gather to praise your name. Use the preparation and the service of their pastors, Johnny Spicer and Adam Viramontes, to accomplish your will in the lives of your saints. And today, God, on Father's Day, I pray for the fathers among us, each of us who have been blessed by your hand to care for and raise our children. We confess we daily need your grace and enabling to father well. I thank you, God, for the many faithful and loving men who have stewarded and who are stewarding the gift of fatherhood. It is no small thing, but a heavenly duty and a spiritual privilege. So give us grace, God, as we love our daughters and nurture their hearts that they might love you. Give us boldness and integrity as we love our sons and live as godly examples of redeemed manhood for them to follow. Strengthen us for this task. Give us grace where we have failed. Only enable us to make much of Jesus that our children might see him clearly. Meet us now in your word. Father, by it, give us what we need. Holy Spirit, through the Word, teach us all that is necessary for salvation and godly living. Lord Jesus, with the power of your Scriptures, make us to be what you desire. We ask this in your perfect name. Amen. I should have said it at the beginning, but I 
forgot. Happy Father's Day, dads and granddads and stepdads and adoptive fathers. Uh, it, is, uh, it is good to be a dad. It is good to be a father. Uh, it is a, a weighty task, uh, and those uh, who are fathers know that. And, uh, and we do need all of God's grace to continue fathering our children in godly ways uh, moving forward. Uh, just by way of announcement one more time, I uh, forgot to at the beginning of the service, but I want to remind our church members that to this coming Tuesday at 1 p.m., uh, one in the afternoon, we will be holding a memorial service for our fellow member and uh, sister in Christ, Mary Hall, who passed away last week. And so I just want to remind the many of you who, who knew her and, and uh, would uh, like to join us in honoring her life and her faith and reminding ourselves uh, of the wonderful joy of knowing Christ uh, through the scriptures that we'll be honoring her life on Tuesday at 1 p.m. And we look forward to sharing that time with you uh, then. I invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them. Uh, if you don't, there ought to be one under the seat in front of you. Take it and open it to Revelation uh, chapter 17. Revelation is easy to find in the Bible. Just go all the way to the end. A couple pages back, you should be there. Revelation. The, uh, if you're new to looking at the Bible, the large numbers on the page are the chapters. The small superscripted numbers are the verses. So we're in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 today. As you're comfortably able, I invite you to stand with me as we honor God by reading His Word. Are you thankful for God's Word? Yes. Me too. Uh, several churches, this is, this is not new, but several churches have a, a tradition of after the Word of God is read, uh, whoever reads it or a pastor after it is read may say, this is God's Word, and the church responds with, thanks be to God. So after I read Revelation 17, 1 through 6, I will say this is God's Word, as we do most weeks, and you will respond if you're thankful for it, thanks be to God. This is what John the Apostle, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in Revelation 17, beginning in verses 1 through 6. He says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. This is God's Word. You may be seated. Most of the time when you write a letter to somebody and you close it at the end, you usually close it with something like, Sincerely, Stephen. Love always, Jane. Yours in Christ, Matthew. When John closed his first letter to the churches that he wrote, 1 John, he closed it this way, John chapter 5, verse 21. The last lines he leaves the church with. Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Last words are important words. The way we close letters, the way we close speeches, the way that we, we, we close conferences, the, the words that we have right at the end are important. John chooses these words to say to the church at the end of his first letter, the same John who, who received this revelation that Jesus gave to him, the same John who wrote the gospel of John, tells the church at the end of his first letter, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Why does John care so much that the church keep itself from idols. We would think it would be an easy thing to do, to just not go worship at pagan temples, to just not give sacrifices to false gods. It seems a pretty easy thing to do, to not have little statues of, of our God or of Jesus or of other gods in our home that we venerate and, and worship in front of. That seems like a pretty easy thing, right? Well, for John and in John's day, I think maybe not so easy. The reminder, those important last words, little children, keep yourselves from idols, is there at the end of his first letter because idolatry was a real threat to the church in John's day. 
It was a real temptation to join in with the world around them in the Roman Empire, worshiping at the temples to false gods, to Greek and and Roman uh, 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 pagan gods and imitations of God. We saw in the letters to the churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, regularly over and again, Paul incur, or excuse me, John, or that's still wrong, Jesus through John, encouraging the church not to compromise their faithfulness, not to compromise their testimony to the truth of the gospel by worshiping in temples to false gods, by engaging in the sexual immorality, which is a, 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 an image for spiritual idolatry, spiritual adultery cheating on God with other gods, not to fall into that as they live in a world that's just rife with it, full of it. And as they lived in a world and in an economy and with religious influence there in Rome that, that beckon people, come, worship at our temples, come, serve our gods. And if you do, you'll get a, you'll get a good place in the market for your stall next week. And if you do, you can continue selling your wares and practicing your trade. And if you do, you'll have lots of well-paying customers. But if you don't, if you don't join us in our idolatry, you won't have any of that. We'll keep you out of the market. You won't be allowed to sell your stuff. You'll struggle to live unless you get on board. John says, John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Why? Because idols are seductive. Idols are seductive, and it's a lot easier to give in to idolatry than often we think. In Revelation 17 and 18, we're introduced to the prostitute who is known as Babylon. I'll probably call her a harlot because I feel like if I say prostitute too many times on a Sunday morning, it's just weird. (laughs) Babylon, the harlot. And we read in chapter 17 and chapter 18 the fall of Babylon, its final destruction and disillusion, which is a, a good thing. We read in these chapters that in light of God's final judgment of all idolatry, that's what He's doing as He judges Babylon here, economic idolatry, social idolatry, philosophical and moral idolatry, as we see God judging this perfectly and finally at the end of all things, believers must be reminded to resist becoming complicit in idolatry. Why? Because God's destroying it. And if we're tied to it, we're standing in the wake of God's in the path of God's destruction. So as the Lamb's people, the people who belong to the, the Lamb who, who, was, who overcomes by His death, as the people who belong to Jesus endure with faith, which is the constant call of revelation, endure with faithfulness till Jesus comes again, as they do, they will rejoice at the final victory of Christ over the harlot Babylon. There is one clear idea to us for us in Revelation 17 and 18. It is a call, a call to Christians. It is this, Christian, resist the seductive allure of idolatry. This is the main idea of our text and of the sermon this morning. Christian, resist, fight against, press back against the seductive allure of idolatry. We need to know as we read through Revelation 17 and 18 and understand what it says this morning, we need to know that idolatry is more subtle than we assume. We need to be able to recognize its allure when it comes. We need to be able to resist idolatry, by holding fast to the truth. And we need to rejoice, to rejoice in the fact that Christ will finally judge idolatry and every spiritual kind of wickedness perfectly at the end of all things. We rejoice in that and rejoice in the fact that there is deliverance coming from evil in every form. We read Revelation 17 verses 1 through 6, and in those verses we learn first this, that idolatry is a seductress. Idolatry is a seductress. As John is here dropped in on this scene, after we've completed the seven bowls of God's wrath, we, we now uh, have kind of a, a tight zoom shot of what's taking place in the fifth and sixth bowls, the judgment upon Babylon. John is dropped in on this scene, and, and we, uh, so we're looking at uh, the bowls, the fifth and sixth bowls, and also that message from that angel in chapter 14, verse 8 of Revelation, who said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And here, as John is dropped in on this scene, he sees a picture of Babylon, that great city, that ancient city, now repictured, not like a city, but like a woman. Now, Babylon, as John sees her, may be a woman, but friends, she is no lady. Babylon is a harlot. Babylon is a prostitute. 
John describes her sitting on many waters, or in your translation you may uh, have read ruling over many waters, which we're told later in chapter 17, verse 15, these many waters are the tribes, nations, tongues, and peoples of the earth. She has authority over them. She rules over them. She has influence among the many cultures. And we're told that she commits immorality with the kings of the earth. Now, again, as we said before, we know from so many places of Scripture that adultery and sexual immorality are the go-to illustration for spiritual idolatry against God. To be married to God, to be united to God in faith, and then to worship other gods alongside Him or instead of Him is to be cheating spiritually on God. It's to be a spiritual adulterer. And so sexual immorality becomes a, a, the go-to illustration of so many authors of Scripture for spiritual idolatry because it's just so fitting. Babylon, this woman who, who pictures a city which is really a system, a system of worldly religious idolatry and compromise. Babylon is a global epidemic. She sits on many waters. She commits adultery with many kings. There's no culture, friends, that is not influenced by the temptation to worship gods and to worship things and to worship people that are not the Lord. Every culture has been influenced by the temptation to pursue affluence, wealth, riches, to follow fleshly lusts and bodily pleasures. You will not find a sinless culture on earth after the fall in Genesis 3. All of them have been influenced, have been affected by this adulterous, idolatrous spirit, and it's alive and well in America and in the West, and it's alive and well in sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia and everywhere even Antarctica, because there are people who live and study as scientists there. Babylon is alive in every culture. She sits on many waters. She commits adultery with her immorality with the kings of the earth. And John pictures her, John sees her riding on a scarlet beast. This scarlet beast has seven blasphemous heads and ten horns. We know that this is the same beast from Revelation 13. That beast who represents satanically influenced political and military powers is what the harlot Babylon rides on. She's propped up, she's carried along by political leaders and despotic emperors, and she is happy to marry, to wed her harlotry to their influence. Idolatry and satanic, despotic, governmental power go hand in hand together. That's a match made in, well, not heaven, but John pictures her dressed to allure, but ultimately reveals that her alluring dress is really just a, a, a way into a, 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 an enticing way into a toxic trap. Babylon the harlot, the mother of all prostitutes and abominations, wears royal colored garments. She wears jewels that promise wealth and, and look like they come from somebody or with somebody who only has large amounts of wealth. Her appearance beckons with a tempting tone, come be with me. Drink my wine. Be happy. Please yourself. She's alluring. John even says in chapter 17, verse 6, that when he saw her, he marveled like, whoa, check that out. That's something to look at. There's something fascinating about Babylon's appearance, this harlot's appearance, but she is a Venus flytrap of a woman. She drips sweetness, but her grasp is deadly idolatry, the promise of wealth, the promise of pleasure, the promise of power. If only you give in to worship things and people and stuff that are not the Lord, drips with sweetness. Doesn't the promise of wealth feel good to you? Doesn't the promise of power to be in control, to be the, the guy or the woman in the room where all the decisions are made to be that person with that influence, isn't that alluring? Isn't it alluring to just be pleased, to have a happy life, to have everything you want and never any hardship? It is. But when we fall into that sweet trap, that sweet bait, the final grasp is, is deadly. I never had a Venus flytrap as a kid. I always wanted one. My mom never let me have one, probably because she knew I'd just let it die, but mostly because I wanted to watch it eat flies. You've seen a Venus flytrap. They're, they're really quite interesting, beautiful uh, plants that open up, and inside they, they 
uh, inside their, their leaves, they produce this super sweet substance that flies and bees and other insects love. And they, they flock to it. And as they land upon it and start eating of it, thinking, I'm in for an easy meal, the fly trap closes. And after it closes, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter all the while producing digestive juices that eat its prey alive. Babylon, friends, is like a Venus flytrap. It says, come, be with me. Drink my wine. Be happy. Be pleased. Have all the things you ever wanted. And in so doing, all I require is everything you have, your soul. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3 through 6 says this, The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. Babylon, pictured as a harlot, is, is not a, it's not a polemic against cities. It's not a polemic against women. It's not a polemic against prostitutes. It's a polemic. It is a, an argument against idolatry. And Babylon, who is a harlot, who leads people to their death, is pictured this way, not so that uh, Christians will say, oh, cities are bad, let's live in the country. Women are bad, let's uh, kick them out of our society. It's not, not to lead us to do that, but to see idolatry for what it is. It's a seductress that only leads to death. Idolatry is, or, or Babylon is dressed to allure. We find she's toxic to the soul. And worse than all of that, she hates those who love Jesus. John describes this harlot not as a refined queen. She, she looks, she's dressed like a queen. She wears jewels like a queen, but she's not a queen. She's a sloppy drunk. And this woman, we find, is three sheets to the wind and not on wine, but on the blood of the saints and on the sewage of her idolatrous immorality. Friends, she is not your friend. She is a death trap. Christian idolatry is not your buddy. It is, a, it is a grave, an open grave, ready to take your life and your soul with her into Sheol. She hates those who love Jesus. She loves to persecute those who will not take part in her immorality. She loves to make life hard and difficult and even put to death those who say, Jesus is Lord, not you. My worship belongs to him, not to you. I don't care if I don't get a spot in the market. I'm not going to worship at your temple. I don't care if I die poor and penniless following Jesus. I'll not get riches following in your wickedness. Amen. And she hates those who love Jesus. She's drunk on the blood of the saints. This picture of Babylon as a harlot, these religious and economic systems that draw, that allure people away from faithfulness to Jesus, but only take them to death. This is a picture of, if, if, if you're willing to hear it, uh, this is a satirical picture of Babylon. You know what satire is? Satire is like political cartoons. You, you look at a political cartoon, and uh, you see a guy with uh, a skinny, slight-looking individual, slightly balding, large ears and a large nose, and you know that it's probably Ross Perot, or at least 25, 30 years ago, you knew it was Ross Perot. Uh, today, I, I don't read political cartoons that much, so I don't really pay too much attention, but in political cartoons, they, the, the authors, of the illustrators of these cartoons satirize the objects that they are, um, that, that, that they are poking fun at. They, they exaggerate their features so as to show um, what sort of person they are or what they are like. And if you can't make out what that person is or who that person is by their particular features, they'll often wear maybe a button on the, on the uh, be drawn with a button on their lapel that has their name on it or maybe a particular uh, political platform or something that they're running for, a way to recognize them for who they are. Right? John sees this harlot drunk on the blood of saints looking just a sloppy mess. And how does he know who she is? She's got a name on her forehead, Babylon, the mother of all prostitutes in the world's abominations. John goes, oh, I know exactly who this is. This is the economic religious systems of the world that are calling people to compromise their worship of Jesus to get along in the world. This is an ugly picture of idolatry, but it's supposed to be ugly. 
This is what Revelation does in so many of, its, uh, of the way that, that Jesus gives these pictures to John to relate to the church, to call us to endurance and to faith. He gives us a picture that, that reveals the, the real spiritual reality behind things. Because idolatry in the marketplace, idolatry in the economy, doesn't necessarily look like a drunk harlot riding on a satanic beast. It often looks a lot more inviting and a lot more appealing than that. But Jesus shows Babylon this way to John so that he can say to the church and help the church to look straight through the veil of economic and religious idolatry so that we can see it for what it really is. A drunk harlot who hates the saints. John's vision goes on. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 17, verses 7 through 14. The angel said to me, when I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast because it was and it is not and it is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings. Five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he, <clears throat> excuse me, when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind. And they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. We see that idolatry is a seductress in the first part of Revelation 17. But now as the vision continues on, John reveals to us, he tells us that idolatry is often propped up by other powers. Idolatry is seductive, but it's propped up, it's enabled by, by other powers, other authorities. Now, I just want to admit, at the front end, Revelation chapter 7, verses 8 through 11 are extremely difficult to interpret because there is a, a fluidity of the images that are presented. Uh, this passage describes the beast that the harlot rides on. And, and just, just catch the fluidity of the imagery here. This beast has seven heads, but the seven heads are seven mountains. And there are also seven kings. And there's ten horns that are also ten kings. And the beast was, but he isn't, but he's about to come and go to destruction. And the ten kings, who are the ten horns, uh, are, are going to be given power. And they're going to give their authority over to the beast to oppose the lamb. The question is, are the seven heads of the beast, are they mountains or are they kings? And are the horns of the beast, are they, are they they're, they're ten kings, I get that. So are there seven kings or ten kings, or are there 17 kings? Or there's the, the images here in this chapter, they, they move around, it's, like playing, it's not really like playing a shell game, it's not deceptive, but the complexity of the image that John sees is such that it's really hard to nail down specific identities to each of the descriptions of the beasts that he gives. The intent of these verses is to describe the beast that the harlot Babylon rides upon. Don't forget that, right? Don't miss that. John is describing the beast that the harlot rides on. Now, its description, having seven heads and ten horns, follows Revelation 13, verse 1. So we identify this beast with the beast from the sea, that, that beast that represents satanically influenced, satanically empowered governments and military powers that persecute the church. It's almost certain that the original readers, that the, the seven churches that received Revelation as a circular letter at first, that they would have identified this beast as Rome, the empire of Rome, because of the description in verses 9 and 10, where John says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. There are also seven kings. The fact that Rome was considered the city on seven hills is historically certain. And this beast has seven heads that are seven hills. The description that the seven heads are also seven kings, though, is kind of tricky. There has been no shortage of attempts to number the emperors uh, of Rome that might fit this description of five who have fallen, one who is, and one who is yet to come. Let me just say this morning, if you came for all the controversy, you won't find it this morning. 
We won't solve that matter of, of uh, how many emperors have come and which one is and which one is not yet in the day of John's writing. There are so many problems with trying to number the emperors that, that we can't even address all the problems here this morning. But a good many commentators have noted them. The chief among the problems of trying to number the heads of the beast with, uh, or identify the various heads of this beast with particular Roman emperors uh, in the past uh, becomes apparent very quickly. The first question is, where do we start numbering? Do we start numbering from Julius Caesar, the first emperor, or do we start numbering from Caesar Augustus, the emperor in the day of Jesus when he was killed? And, and if we, know the, if, we know the, if, we, if we can't know the starting point, it's also hard to know the end point. And by the way, even if you're just counting chronologically, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you get to a really difficult part in the years 68 and 69 AD, because after Nero, uh, Caesar Nero died, there were four emperors that followed him in a course of about 18, to 18 months to two years that all ruled in very quick succession, like came to power, died, came to power, died, came to power, died, came to power, died, and then finally another emperor came along that kind of solidified the situation. So you have these four emperors that were all relatively insignificant. Nobody in history really talks very much about them. They didn't do a whole lot except die. So counting all of the emperors, whether you start with Julius Caesar in the years before Jesus was ever born, or Caesar Augustus, who was, C who, who was Caesar in the days of Jesus, however you count, it gets really confusing really fast, and you start having to do some, some weird sort of historical backflips to try to make it all fit just perfectly extrapolations to future kings, trying to take these seven heads or the ten horns, the ten kings that are to come, trying to extrapolate them out into the future of, uh, of thinking that these, are not, these aren't historic kings, these are future kings who will come in the time of Western civilization. Even those kinds of speculations eventually falter as well because many hundreds of kings have come and gone since John wrote, and the end has not yet come. So I don't think we... we do, we don't do best to consider the historical identity of the beast and the heads. I think we do best to consider the theological identity of the beast and its heads. The beast, we know from Revelation 13, is a blasphemous imitator of God. We're reminded here that this beast has blasphemous names on its head. John's description that the beast was and is not and is about to go to destruction, if we're just reading that without any other context, seems really confusing. Oh, the, the beast is gone he, or was in the past. He had his day. He's, uh, he's not around now, but he's going to come soon. So we better watch out for that beast as he comes. If we're not reading this with any context of the rest of Revelation, we can start trying to figure out and set our eschatological alarm clocks as to when that beast is going to show up. But remember how God is so often described as revelation. This beast was, is not, is about to go to destruction. He had his day. He doesn't have his day now. And the only thing that's going to come in the future is his death and destruction, praise God. Amen. Whereas God regularly, time and again throughout Revelation, is not described as the one who was, who is not, and is about to go to destruction. But God is always described as the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. The beast is a blasphemous imitator of God, and he fails at his imitation. Where God is omnipresent in time and in space, he was, he is, he is to come. The beast, friends, is limited. The beast is hindered. Five of his heads are dead and about to be destroyed. And furthermore, he garners the love and the attention of earth dwellers, those who, dw who dwell on the earth in the same way as its image was, is worshipped by those who take its mark, we saw in Revelation 13. The beast's heads are almost completed. Five are gone, one is, one is about to come, and then there's an eighth that belongs to the seven. Gosh, John, could you please be a little clearer? The fact that most of its heads are dead and just a few are left to go may be an indicator, not, not of specific kings to come, but it may be an indicator of the nearness of the imminence of the end of persecution. The beast is almost dead. This is good news. The beast is almost dead. Now, when it comes to the ten horns on the beast's seven heads, who are also ten kings, these are probably to be seen in parallel with the kings of the earth that, that are gathered together at the end of the, the bowl judgments. It's really hard for us to try to identify them specifically. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, the most popular attempt to identify these 10 kings specifically was during the creation of the European Union in 1993. 
Although as soon as the European Union surpassed 10 countries as part of the Union, that theory of the 10 kings being the European Union was, was quickly abandoned. Ah, it can't be that anymore because there's 13 or 14 or however many more belong to it. There may be something to the number of kings, 10 of them, that does not imply specificity of number, but rather plurality of power. We see that number 10 being used symbolically all throughout Revelation to speak about a plurality of things. Ten kings represents a plurality of power. There will be a plurality of power that gives its allegiance to the beast, who aligns with the beast, who worships the beast, who loves the harlot that rides on it. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee has written this, that John's present concern in describing these ten horns who are ten kings John's present concern is not with historical precision, but with historical reality. Namely, that the ten kings together have one purpose, to give their power and authority to the beast and to give him their allegiance, a plurality of power giving allegiance to military and governmental powers that oppose God's people. Now, whether the beast represents past emperors, present rulers, or future kings is less important than recognizing the source of their power, Satan. Don't forget that. Further, we do well not to fixate on who the beastly heads are, but rather what they support. They support an immoral economic and religious system called Babylon, figuratively, spiritually, that rejoices in blasphemy and rejoices in idolatry and celebrates in the destruction of the saints. The beast represents the satanic schemes of worldly governments throughout history and into the future that align together to undermine the gospel, to persecute the saints, to attempt to destroy the church. But ultimately, the beast is unsuccessful because he's been conquered by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony of the saints as we read in Revelation. Powerful as this beast may appear, he is about to be delivered to final destruction at the hand of the one who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. John's vision goes on. The angel said to me, verse 15, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose of being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. If you had any question as to what the original readers of Revelation would have thought about who the beast or who, excuse me, who the harlot is... John gives us a big clue in verse 18. The woman you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. There was one great city that had dominion over the known world in the first century. It was Rome. So the readers, Christians in the first century reading Revelation are thinking, when they see harlot, they think Rome. And not necessarily Rome specifically and only, but Rome as an image, Rome as a type, Rome as a a pattern-setting picture for idolatrous religious and economic systems in the future. These last four verses, though, of chapter 17 tell us something more important than who the harlot is. They tell us that idolatry and all of its evils will ultimately be destroyed. The last verses of chapter 17 reveal the final fall of Babylon. But notice, Babylon does not fall directly by God's hand, but by the beast and the kings of the world who conspire against the harlot. They hate her, the one who rides on them. They despise her. They strip her naked and kill her. Understand, idolatry and evil and every form of opposition to God is ultimately self-defeating. It's ultimately self-destruction, self-destruction. Thank you. Self-destructive. And what's more, God has so ordained and sovereignly worked to cause the forces of sin and false worship to implode from within. We see this unholy union between the beast and the harlot, and ultimately it ends in this great divorce whereby the harlot is killed by the beast and the kings that give it authority. Satanic influence, Sinful lusts married together are ultimately self-destructive. And God has so ordained it to be. This is a good thing. This is a good thing that God says, try as you might, Satan. Work hard as you may, sinful people, against me. You will ultimately be the cause of your own ruin. 
Now, even as God used the Assyrians and the Babylonians in the Old Testament as enemies of Israel to be agents of God's judgment against idolatrous Israel, so also does the beast who is opposed to God unwittingly become the one who brings God's justice against the harlot Babylon, only himself to ultimately go to destruction as well. Idolatry and evil, friends, will ultimately be defeated from within and by God's sovereign plan that they do so. Now, there's better news. Ah, it's better news, but news continued. Revelation chapter 18. This is a long chapter, so buckle up. We're going to read it. John says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. We read that same message from an angel in Revelation 14, 8. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants have, uh, of earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup that she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day. Death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more, and a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of a bridegroom and a bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Mercy. Revelation 18 shows us that God's judgment on evil as he judges Babylon and the kings that conspire with her and the beast along with them, that God's judgment on evil ultimately reveals human allegiances. It reveals the things that we, the things that we rejoice in today reveal our allegiance when they are gone ultimately. Revelation 18 reads like a funeral march 
with everyone who got powerful, with everyone who got rich, off of the idolatry with Babylon, singing their own mournful funeral dirge, their lament at the death and destruction of Babylon. Now, before the funeral starts, though, we hear from an angel at the beginning of chapter 18 speaking judgment on Babylon. She goes to destruction because she is a haunted city. She's a haunted culture. She's a haunted society. She is a haunted philosophy. She is a haunted economy full of everything unholy. And this is her indictment. Everything that is unholy, Babylon has loved. She has become a haunted mansion full of unclean spirits. Moreover, there's a call to those who are citizens of heaven but find their living quarters in Babylon. To these, God says, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, verse 4. Now, I don't think this is a call to segregate ourselves as believers physically from the sinful world. It's, It's not necessarily a call to go join the Amish in Pennsylvania or Ohio, but rather this is a call to not be one who dwells in Babylon who makes their home in Babylon. You may live there. You may pay rent there. That may be where your house is, but your home must not be there. When Babylonians, when the Babylonians took the Judahites into captivity in the Old Testament, God said to the Judahites in Jeremiah 29, 7, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So coming out of Babylon is a call not to make Babylon our spiritual homeland not to compromise with idolatry, not to engage in spiritual or sexual immorality that characterizes what Babylon is all about, but rather to be holy, to be different, to live as though we've been called by God to pursue His purposes in the world in the midst of an unholy culture, an unholy philosophy, an unholy economy. Be holy as God our Father in heaven is holy. Pursue godliness in a godless culture. Repent of sin among a people who indulge it. We're called here in coming out of Babylon not to celebrate what the lost world celebrates. Understand, and I understand, that I'm saying this in the month of June, which is so called by the secular world Pride Month, where the world rejoices in, holds up with pride the LGBTQ plus agenda, a a, a system, a, a, a worldview. Uh, an, uh, an approach to human sexuality that clearly defies God's holy design for marriage and sexuality. That marriage is between one man and one woman in covenant relationship for a lifetime. That, that sexuality is a gift of God. Sexual expression is a gift of God, but meant for the confines of such a uh, heterosexual covenant marriage. We live in a culture that is not altogether un-Babylonian, that celebrates with pride things that clearly defy God's character and His intention for how we ought to live. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. This is not a call to to leave Western culture behind and, and create a commune somewhere out in the desert, but rather it's a call to faithfully not celebrate what Scripture calls sin. Because the end of sin, the result of sin, where sin is going, where idolatry is going, where every system that supports it is going, is destruction. So separate yourselves, Christian. Do not celebrate what the world celebrates. Do not give in to to pride of any sin, of any sort, because it's deadly. Now, working through the funeral procession in chapter 18, we see all of those who align themselves with Babylon crying out in grief and despair. Why? Why? Because they achieved their wealth, they got their power from participating in Babylon's abominable sins. The kings of the earth come first, and they weep and they wail because their ungodly courtesan is dead. Yet they dare not come near her, lest they catch fire by her burning. Then the merchants of the world come up to sing their song, and they weep and they mourn because their economy is dead. The means of their great wealth is gone. Everyone who bought their goods from literally all over the world are gone. And now the merchants are destitute. These people who got wealthy off of ungodly economies are now poor and have no means of making ends meet. Now, lest we think the merchants' work is not necessarily evil, let us note the final item on their list of goods. Because we could look at all the things that they sell and trade, gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, on and on and on and on and on. 
And, and we see those things traded uh, in the world today, right? All kinds of scented wood. Some of you buy cedar from Home Depot to put in your closets, right? And it smells nice. There are a lot of these aspects of economy that we would say in and of themselves are not evil. Right? We have these trades in the world today, and trades are good. You have cinnamon in your spice cabinet because somebody brought it to you from somewhere else in the world. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But we should see this list, all of the things that the merchants are participating in. The whole list, all collectively, is ultimately evil, particularly by the last item on that list. Do you see it? And they traded slaves. That is human souls. In case any of us were under any, any sort of preconception that slaves were not human. It is a system that is rotten from within. It's a system that gets wealthy, that is propped up, propped up by the trafficking of human souls. Friends, if you ever needed an apologetic, uh, a defense for the abolition of chattel slavery in the, in the West uh, so many hundreds of years ago, it's right here in Revelation 18, 13. Trafficking in, in slaves, which are human souls, is abominable to God and akin to, it is aligned with Babylon. So the merchants of the world weep and wail because all their economy is dead. And then the sea merchants come next, telling us that Babylon has, ha, ha, uh, telling us that Babylon has its tentacles in the economy and the worship of both land and sea. She is a, a global dominion, so to speak. She sits on many waters, and she promises to make people of every tribe and nation and tongue wealthy by worshiping false gods with her. All of her economic trade is thrown into ruin. This chapter closes with a final angelic curse upon Babylon. It's that the words of the final uh, of the angel. So Babylon, the great, will be thrown down with violence. She'll be found no more. The sound of harpists and music, music will be there no more. No more crafts, no more sound of the mill, no more light, no more weddings, no more merchants. All of it is, all of it is going to destruction. When Babylon falls, friends, it's lights out for her. There's no return for her, and everyone who loves her goes with her, like that millstone thrown into the sea. When I was a little boy and we would go to a lake, uh, I take that back, even as a grown man when I go to a lake, I like to find the biggest stinking rock I can pick up and huck it into the lake. Why? Because I like watching the big splash. It's dramatic. Now, the frustrating thing about it is you don't get that rock back. It sinks to the bottom. But this is the image that, that, that John has shown of Babylon's judgment. She is like a millstone thrown into the sea to sink to the bottom, never to return. When God judges Babylon, it's lights out forever in dramatic fashion. And not just for Babylon, not just for idolatrous systems, but for all people who align with her too. God's final judgment of idolatry reveals allegiances. Friend, if you rejoice, if you celebrate in the wealth that this world can give you, you will lament with great sorrow on the day of its destruction. But rather, friend, if you rejoice today in Christ who died to redeem you from every sin, was raised from the dead to make you right with God, if you rejoice in being persecuted for righteousness' sake in this day, you will not lament the fall of Babylon in the end. If you lament sin today, you will rejoice in Christ's coming. If you lament a Babylonian worldly system in economy and religion and idolatry and politics, if you lament Satan's influence in everything around you today, you will rejoice on the day when Christ judges it perfectly and completely. But that day of judgment will reveal allegiances. Those who love the world will mourn its loss. Those who lamented the sin of the world will rejoice in the holiness of Christ that comes. The fall of Babylon shows us the seductive allure of idolatry and also the disastrous end that it comes to. So what do we do in light of this? What is the call in light of, of this? What truth do we hold on to knowing that Babylon is going to destruction? I give you this one thing. Know this today. Christian and not yet Christian alike. The conqueror of Babylon is your stronghold against idolatry. How do I resist falling into idolatry? You resist falling into idolatry by finding your safety, by finding your refuge, by finding your anchor in the one who ultimately conquers it. Now, there's no denying it. Our culture is changing around us at a rapid pace. 
Even I, who was born in 1982, who, who am akin to or, or, or well uh, used to just quick changes in technology and things changing fast. I grew up with computers. I know that things move quickly. Even I am sometimes taken aback at the, at the lightning speed with which our culture seems to be changing. Now, I'm not certain that this necessarily means the end of all things is about to come in our lifetime. It may or may not. I'm not totally certain that our culture today is altogether more sinful than so many other cultures in the past. I just think we're particularly creative about it right now. But I am certain that what we see is a growing influence of Babylon in the global West, a love of idolatry, a love of immorality, a love of wealth and affluence that the world can give to us. It's growing in the global West. And Babylon, this harlot, doesn't look like worship at pagan temples It doesn't necessarily look like in our culture sacrificing animals to false gods or cultic prostitution. Rather, she's present in the ongoing worship of self and self-serving ideologies. She invites us not to celebrate a uh, she she invites us to celebrate a sexual ethic that's not only contrary to what God has designed, but that ultimately denigrates people to less than human. Under this view, our, our identity, uh, the, the LGBTQ agenda, places the identity of the person. Uh, which uh, not as image bearers of God, but rather as the sum total of their bodily desires or psychological identification. Babylon says, you are whatever you feel like having sex with. And she doesn't, she, she does say, Babylon does say that we have to take part in both sexual immorality to worship and that sexual immorality is to be worshiped. Babylon today tempts us with the allure of power and tells us to take a side so that we can get power. Don't you want power? Don't you want to be strong? Don't you want to be an influencer? Pick a side so you can get it. Now, of course, she doesn't say out loud that both sides are ultimately wicked because both sides ultimately just want to be strong. Babylon doesn't care which side you're on. She just wants you on a side so you can be powerful and, and, and worship at the temple of power. In this very wild landscape of confusing, tempting, divisive invitations to give glory and to find pleasure in godless imitations of divinity, friends, it can feel absolutely overwhelming to try to figure out your way in the world. I, more than once, have looked at the headlines of the day and going, my goodness, I'm going to raise children in this world. All right? Like, when we can laugh because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> It would be funny if it weren't so sad. How will you resist sin? How will you know what is true? How will you not be caught up in the coming destruction of godlessness, the way that it's described in the fall of Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18? How do we make it through? How do we endure with faithfulness? Because that's the call of Revelation. As followers of Jesus, how do we make it through enduring with faithfulness until Jesus comes again and not give in to Babylon, not become friends with Babylon? I submit to you the answer is not all that hard. The answer is not unclear to us either, fellow Christians. We find our stronghold, we find our shelter, we find our home base, we find our homeland, we find our anchor against idolatrous Babylon in every age and in every culture in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only conqueror of the harlot and the beast that she rode in on, Jesus Christ. You want to know how to make your way through a strange world? Hold fast to Jesus. You want to know how to figure out how to be faithful to Christ in the midst of things that are changing at seemingly breakneck speed? Hold fast to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus the Christ, God in human form who died for sins and was raised from the dead so that all who believe in him and repent of their sin might be forgiven, put in right relationship with God, and have the hope and the promise of eternal life with him forever endure with faithfulness by holding fast to Christ. I love chapter 18 verse four, or chapter 17 verse 14. The kings in concert with the beast will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them. For he is lord of lords and he is king of kings and those with him Those who are united to Christ by faith, those who make Christ their stronghold in a crazy world, those who are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Friend, if you want to know how to endure in a crazy culture, hold fast to Jesus. Hold fast to Jesus. 
hold fast to Jesus. And my promise is that the harder, the, the tighter you hold on to Jesus, the tighter he'll hold on to you too. Understand this, you can never hold on to him too tightly. Right? And there is no one that he has held on to with his hands that will ever escape his grasp. Amen. He will hold us fast. So trust in Jesus. Friend, if you don't know this Jesus today, if you find yourself tossed and torn and, and thrown all around by the shifting winds and the shifting sands of a crazy culture, I invite you to find an anchor. I invite you to find a homeland in the person of Jesus Christ and among the people that are his body and his bride who are joined to him and held fast in his grasp. Know Jesus. Trust him. Turn from your sin. Give your life to him in faith. Be saved today and have the promise of eternal life even afterward. Let's pray together. And friends, as a response this morning, we're going to sing a song together. It's a song we've sung before. It may not be that familiar, but I invite you, make it familiar to your hearts today. A song called, He Will Hold Me Fast, a promise of Christ's hold and, and stronghold of His people who belong to Him. This will be our song of response today. And if you need to make a decision, if you need to follow Christ in faith this morning uh, for the first time, don't wait till next week. Do it this morning. Come find me, Pastor Danny, one of our Bible study leaders, find another Christian in this room today and say, I need to know this Jesus. I need to not find my home in him. And friends, we who know Christ, let's be faithful to point those who need to know Jesus, to point them to him faithfully and clearly today. Let's pray. God, our Father, the one who was and who is and who is to come, the never-changing perfect, divine creator and sustainer of all things. We pray, help us make our home in you. Help us find our anchor in Christ, your son. Help us to find solid ground to stand on in Jesus. By your Holy Spirit, for those of us who have trusted Christ, enable us to withstand the allure of idolatry in this world that we might live as holy people, as you are holy and called us to be holy, that we might live as salt and light in a decaying and a dark world so the people of the world might see our good deeds and glorify you. Help us to live that way. Lead us to be faithful. Help us to endure. We pray this for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.